Hello there, welcome to Miss Yusuf's English class. In this video, we are going to study The Zulu Girl by Roy Campbell. But before getting into the poem, let's learn about the writer. Roy Campbell was born in Durban, South Africa in the year 1901. He was educated in Durban and then spent a year at Oxford University before returning home where he established a satirical literary magazine entitled Vorslag. Um, Campbell used irony and humour to expose and criticise people, often targeting Afrikaners. He lived in France and Spain and served in the English army in World War II. Campbell eventually settled in Portugal where he died in a vehicle accident in 1957. Let's read The Zulu Girl by Roy Campbell. When in the sun the hot red acres smolder, down where the sweating gang its labour plies. A girl flings down her hoe and from her shoulder unslings her child, tormented by flies. She takes him to a ring of shadow pulled by thorn trees, purpled with the blood of ticks, while her sharp nails in slow caresses ruled, prowl through his hair with sharp electric clicks. His sleepy mouth, plugged by the heavy nipple, tugs like a puppy, grunting as he feeds. Through his frail nerves, her own deep languors ripple like a broad river sighing through its reeds. Yet, in that drowsy stream, his flesh imbibes an old, unquenched, unsmotherable heat, the curbed ferocity of beaten tribes, the sullen dignity of their defeat. Her body looms above him like a hill within whose shade a village lies at rest, or the first cloud, so terrible and still, that bears the coming harvest in its breast. Right, let's break down the poem section by section. Right, when in the sun the hot red acres smolder. Right, immediately the speaker opens the poem with some very, very emotive words, some very, very vivid imagery, creating uh, the setting and setting the tone and the mood for the poem. Uh, you've got the word hot, you've got the word red, you've got the word smolder, okay, which are all uh, very emotive, vivid descriptions. And um, it, it, it's to highlight, it's to emphasize the um, harsh conditions, the unfavorable working conditions, almost inhumane, okay? But these people are working in the field, on the farm, under these conditions. Uh, the image uh, also is uh, an essentially innately South African image. Uh, anyone who is South African would understand this this image when the sun is incredibly harsh and it's just about setting after a day of intense heat in the middle of the summer the field would turn orange red as the sun is setting and the grass then would take on this orange hue to the point where it becomes red and the glow of the sun as it's setting it makes the field look as though it is set on fire and it's not just how it looks. Standing in that field, that is how you would feel. You would feel incredibly uncomfortable, incredibly hot. So with the very first line, the speaker sets the mood. He, he shows us immediately the conditions under which these people are working. Okay? Smolder is to burn. Down where the sweating gang, its labor plies. Right, so sweating, of course, because of the heat that we just described. Uh, there are, is a group of laborers and they are working. Now, there are a group of laborers, a group of workers who are farm laborers working. But the word that is used to describe this group of people is the word gang, which again is an emotive word because it has, uh, it has inflection, it has a negative connotation because gang is generally associated with criminal activity, suspicious behavior, uh, some sort of delinquency. And it's an unfair description because it's applied to a group of people who are actually working hard under unfavorable conditions, trying to earn an honest wage, whatever that wage may be. Considering that this is a poem uh, that has a social divide uh, with the haves and the have-nots, and we are focusing in this poem on the have-nots, uh, it's honest labor. 
And so the word gang is unfairly applied to them because they're not up to suspicious behavior. They are not up to criminal activity. They are workers who are actually trying to earn a wage. So again, you've got that image of, um, of a social divide uh, where the, the unfortunate or the less fortunate people are working under unfavorable conditions. And among this group of, of, of grown-ups, you have a girl. A girl flings down her hoe and from her shoulder unslings her child tormented by flies. Very vivid image here. You don't have a, 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 a female that's described as a woman. Okay, the word girl, it is emotive. It, it, it shows us again um, a social, a socioeconomic uh, condition. A young girl, and we're going to find just now that she actually has a young baby with her. Uh, having only recently given birth to this child, she is now working among uh, uh, hardworking, probably men, uh, under these really harsh conditions. A young girl working on the field, having just had a baby. But look at her character. She flings down her hole. The word flings actually gives us an indication about her fire, her passion, her feist. Um, she flings down her hoe. It's a little act of rebellion. It's a little act of protest, a little act of frustration. The act of this young girl showing some attitude, showing no regard, showing no respect for this instrument that she's working with. Her job is just her job. It's just a means of earning a wage for her and her child. She flings down her hoe, okay? And from her shoulder, she unslings her child, right? Again, a very vulnerable image of a mother and a child but the child is tormented by flies, again contributing to that overall image of the unfavorable working conditions. The baby is being irritated by flies. Right, she takes him to a ring of shadow pulled by thorn trees. Right, we already have in the first line that very, very uncomfortable image of how hot and unfavorable the weather is. And she finds a, uh, a little grove, a little um, ring of trees that provides some shade. And that is where she's going to nurse her child. Purpled with the blood of ticks. Again, ticks links in with fleas. Uh, unhygienic conditions, poor working conditions, not very favorable, especially for a little child uh, who is physically vulnerable to have uh, flies and ticks uh, crawling all over him. Not very healthy, not very safe, not very sanitary. While her sharp nails in slow caresses ruled prowl through his hair with sharp electric clicks. So one of the ways of her showing this physical intimacy with him, sharing this moment with him, not only breastfeeding, as we are going to see in the next line, but she's also picking the ticks from his hair. And she is uh, breaking them between her fingernails. And she's doing it with such regular, almost mechanical um, uh, motion that it sounds like an electric click. And you've got the click, which is an onomatopoeia, uh, mimicking the sound that she's making as she pops the ticks between her nails. Again, contributing to that image of an uns unsanitary environment. Right, his sleepy mouth plugged by the heavy nipple tugs like a puppy grunting as he feeds. So you have here a simile. He, the baby, is being compared to a puppy. In the same way that a puppy grunts in satisfaction as he feeds from his mother's nipple, so does this baby grunt in satisfaction as he feeds from his mother's nipple. Remember that he is not going to be as affected by the socioeconomic um, environment in which they live. He only knows that this is his mother and this uh, is her time to feed him. He's not going to be uh, aware of the workers working under these conditions and his mother being young and his situation being um, being poor. He's only going to know that right now he's being fit. Right, through his frail nerves, her own deep languors ripple like a broad river sighing through its reeds. Again, lots of imagery here. Right, we've got the word frail, okay, which indicates vulnerability. Um, this child is described as having frail nerves. Now, not to be mistaken with weakness, uh, with the tendency to break or be destroyed because of age. They're frail because they're underdeveloped, because they're young. The thing about the difference between being frail and old and weak and being frail and young and underdeveloped is the fact that when the old frailty breaks, 
there is almost no chance of recovery. But this child is frail and vulnerable only because he is so young. The image here is that he's still going to grow, he's still going to develop, okay? And that is an overarching message. He's frail not because he's weak and breakable, he's frail only because he's young. But he's not always going to be young. He's not always going to be a little baby depending on his mother. He's going to grow into a boy and then he's going to be a youth and then he's going to be a man. And so that frailty is going to fall away. That frailty is going to develop into strength and power, right? So for now, he is frail, yes, okay, but he's not always going to be. Through his frail nerves, her own deep languors ripple. So here, his mother is transmitting a lot of things to him. And the word things, very loosely used. Yes, she is feeding him. So she is passing on that milk, that nourishment, that sustenance from her to him. But along with that, in this act of breastfeeding, she also appears to be transmitting her own emotion to him, her own sentiments to him, her own feelings to him. And remember earlier, we saw her fling down that hoe? right? We know just from that word fling that she is no uh, wallflower. She, she's, a str she's a strong woman. She's a passionate woman. She knows what's fair and what's not fair. She knows what's favorable and unfavorable. She's very aware of her situation. So this is not a silly girl or a weak girl. And all of this passion, all of this fire that she has, she's sending to her child in this moment of, 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 of intimacy between them. A lot more is being shared than just milk from a mother to a child. And the comparison that the speaker is giving us here, like a broad river sighing through its reeds. So the mother is the river, she is the river water, and the baby is the reeds. So you have reeds growing in the river, right? The river has its own nature and its own characteristic, and the reeds have their own nature and their own characteristic. But the river nurtures the reeds and allows it to grow and to become what it is. In the same way that this child has his own character and the mother has his own character, but he is depending on her to sustain him and to nurture him. Okay, but they, are, they each have their own characteristic. However, the river water is influencing the reeds in some way. You're going to see water marks on the reeds. In the same way, you're going to see passion of the mother imprinted on the child. You're going to see her temperament uh, in him as well. You're going to see her passion in him, her power in him, even her frustration in him. She's going to leave that mark on her in the same way uh, river water re leaves its marks on the reeds that grow uh, in it. Right? Yet in that drowsy stream, his flesh imbibes an old, unquenched, unsmotherable heat. Some big words here. So you've got the word yet at the beginning of the line, and yet always introduces a change. So we are talking at the beginning of that line about how she's passing on her, her passions to him, and he is a reed, and she's like a river, and she's influencing uh, his growth. But yet in that drowsy stream, okay, we're talking about his blood now. Yet in that blood, in that flesh is already an unquenched and unsmotherable heat. So here now you're looking at the child, you're focusing on the child and you're talking about how, yes, his mother's giving him milk. Yes, his mother is also sharing a lot of her emotions with him, a lot of her sentiments with him, a lot of her frustrations with him. But he already has something in him that belongs to him inherently, essentially, right? We're talking about his DNA. We're talking about his genetic makeup. We're talking about the blood that runs in his veins, right? That has been passed on from generation to generation to generation. Here we are talking about an entire nation, the Zulu nation, okay? And all of the history that belonged to all the Zulus passes down in their blood from generation to generation. And this child has got that same blood in him. It's unquenched and it's unsmotherable right? In other words, it cannot be put out. It cannot be satisfied. It's not something that you can switch off. It's not something that you can just stop in its tracks if it's unfavorable. It is who he is. It makes him what he is. And as young as he is now, it is in him. And it's only going to grow with time as he grows from a baby to a young boy, to a youth, to a man. 
Right, the curbed ferocity of beaten tribes, the sullen dignity of their defeat. All of these qualities, all of these characteristics, this very nature is already in him. It's already in his blood. It's already in his flesh. It's already in his skin. It's already in his limbs. It's already in his mentality. It's already going to be part of his conscious and unconscious self. Right? Um, there is going to be ferocity in him that came with that blood. There's going to be dignity in him that came with that blood from the nation, from the forefathers, passed on from the ancestors, passed on from his father and his father before him and his father before that. Right? And... Uh, the word ferocity, the word dignity, again, very emotive words to say that he is going to be very hard to defeat as a character. He's going to be very strong and powerful as a man, as all Zulu children are. They are people of the earth and that blood that runs in their veins is incredibly powerful, incredibly strong, incredibly proud, incredibly dignified. Right, and again here you have the word tribes. How do we go from a little baby to an entire tribe. Now that's the beauty of this poem. At this point, it stops being about a mother and a child and starts being about all mothers and all children. And I'm gonna show you how now. Right, we're gonna have a simile here and we're gonna focus on the mother in the same way that we just focused on the child. At some point in this poem, the poem goes, like I said, from being about a mother feeding her baby on a farm to being a poem about all African mothers and all African children. Because as much as Zulu culture shows the strength of the man and the power of the king and the incredible pride of the tribe, women play such an incredible role in nourishing that because without the women, there will be no rise to the next generation of Zulu children. So this poem gives equal attention and acknowledgement to the young boys right in the form of the he being the child but it also here in these last few lines celebrate the contribution that women make that mothers make to giving rise to that next generation so this is how she does that her body yes this one single mother's body but all mother's bodies her body looms above him like a hill within whose shade a village lies at rest Right. So geographically speaking, or, or, or in terms of strategically speaking, when a village is to settle in an area, they will always look for a place of safety where they will have a place for lookout and they will be safe from attack and they'll be safe from elements and they'll be safe from predators. Right. And a village can only prosper if it knows it is safe. So this mother in this simile is given the quality of a hill or a mountain or a raised area that is protecting the village which is the child so this mother like all african mothers are the hills that protect their villages and their villages are the children why because a village you'll settle with a few people and then that village will grow that settlement will grow and grow and grow and become successful and expand so in the same way this baby now is a baby but then he's going to be a young boy then he's going to be a youth then he's going to be a man then he's going to be a father and then his his tribe is going to grow and expand so without this mother protecting this village without this hill protecting this village and without this mother protecting the child it can't really prosper in safety and security and that's what she's offering him or she is like the first cloud, so terrible and still, that bears the coming harvest in its breast. Okay, so in that breast now, yes, you have milk that is nourishing and sustaining, but it also has in it, if you look at it figuratively, the simile here, uh, it comes in with a lot of power, that cloud that's heavy with rain. And it doesn't always come with lightning and thunder and causing havoc in the sky. Sometimes, a heavy rain can come quietly and it can fall on land and it can give rise to so much of growth and so much of prosperity right when rain falls to the ground it allows growth it allows photosynthesis it allows reproduction it allows a harvest okay and again with this rain comes the rise of prosperity when there's no rain there's drought and the land suffers. It's barren. 
there is no future generation but with this mother she's very quiet she's very still but her terrible the word terrible isn't to be looked at in a negative way terrible as in great great and powerful she's coming in quietly terribly powerfully and she's got this water in her cloud that's going to nourish the land and this mother doesn't have to be vocal about her protestation she doesn't have to be vocal about her rebellion she very quietly flung that hoe down she didn't go and scream that this is not the life i want to live she just flung it on the floor and did what she had to do in the same way this cloud will come very quietly do what it needs to do drop its rain onto the land and ensure that there is a successful harvest and this mother is quietly going to feed her baby and know that one day he's going to grow into a man and continue that line of proud zulu people and again we're not talking about just one mother who is one hill protecting one village we're talking about hundreds of thousands of zulu mothers who are like hills who are protecting hundreds and thousands of zulu children who are villagers they are going to grow and they are going to expand and they are going to carry that pride and that passion and that dignity and that ferocity of the zulu nation with them and make sure that that line never dies Okay, that's the end of our analysis of the Zulu girl. I would just like to acknowledge that I do not own these beautiful images that I used in this presentation. All images credit to the artists. I found them on Google. Uh, please let me know in the comments if I need to remove them or if I need to um, locate the artist, but they do not belong to me and all, uh, all credit to whom they belong. Okay, that was the Zulu girl by Roy Campbell. And with that, we end this video. I hope to see you again soon. Goodbye for now.